pretty much make people do what we want if we have the right skill sets. Okay, NLP differs from orthodox hypnosis in that it looks at the structure of subjective human experience rather than the story that we live. So um, many people who gain weight, uh, especially if it's more than 10 to 20 pounds, usually it's body armor. There's issues in their life that the weight is there to protect them from. It's a way of seeking security or to keep an event or an experience from happening again. Usually it's some kind of inappropriate sexual advances or comments, things like that. As a hypnotist and a regression therapist, what I would do is I would take that person back to that moment and have them reprocess that experience, vent the emotional contact, content, get forgiveness or acceptance of the event, uh, deal with whoever was involved, and move them forward. NLP is going to take them back to where do they store that event. It's like when I was working with Yuval, I had him reach out and touch the picture. Where is it in your body? Then they would go even further and they would do things like, okay, well, is the picture in color or black and white? Is it moving or is it still? Is there any sound with it? Right? And it would begin to systematically change those elements. Okay? We'll go more into that later, but that's, that's the difference between how we do thing, a lot of things in orthodox hypnosis versus NLP. In NLP, the meaning of any communication is the response that you get. So if I ask Eric how he's doing, and he says, my dog is brown, somehow in his world, what I did was basically the, the, the question, what color is your dog? <laughs> it's a nonsensical example, but that's basically how the principle of NLP works. Regardless of what your intent is, the behavior you, you elicit in the other person is the meaning of your communication. So, as a neurolinguistic programmer, your job is to become increasingly more flexible in how you communicate to pay very, very close attention to the dynamics of the person that you're dealing with and their model of how the world works so that you can communicate to them in a way that they understand you. You have to communicate to them in their language. Make sense? So the onus to change and be flexible is always on you, not the client. Okay. All distinctions human beings make are able to make concerning our environment and our behavior can be usefully represented through visual, auditory, kinesthetic, olfactory, and gustatory senses. I call this the building blocks of thought. Okay? When you have a thought, when you have a memory, when you have an experience of any kind, it's always expressed in terms of visual, auditory, kinesthetic, olfactory, or gustatory phenomena. There isn't anything else. Well, so what about intuition? Intuition's a feeling. It's kinesthetic, usually. Okay? The resources an individual needs to affect a change are already within them. Yes and no. This is the world according to David. I may differ with Richard, but here's the thing you need to understand. Any, you can generate any resource within somebody that you can name and describe. So in other words, if I want Chris to be more confident, what I, all I have to really do is name the state and begin to describe it in a way that's meaningful to Chris, and it will begin to amplify in Chris. He will start to experience that resource or that state. Conversely, I can also go through his memory banks and find times in his life when he was, in fact, more confident, revivify those experiences, amplify them, and link them to other things. So, in that manner of speaking, the resources he needs are always inside of him. Okay? What I have discovered is that anytime you can tap into a remembered resource, it always tends to have more impact than one you engineer. Okay? The pathways have already been created, it's been rehearsed, you can leverage a lot more amplitude. But, imagination still works. And depending on the degree of absorption, and critical factor bypass you can get, 
it can be just as powerful. Okay? Is this useful, by the way? That's the same as psychic. Yeah. We had it first. Probably. Mm. <laughs> okay. Um, the map is not the territory. Okay. If I spread out a map on the floor, then I can see the pathway from here to my house. Did I get to my house? No, right? The map is just a representation. It's just a way of, of expressing a relationship in our brains with a lot of information removed. It's been deleted, it's been distorted, it's been generalized. The problem that we have is that we tend to associate the description with the experience. We tend to think they're the same thing. So if I say, the marker is red, right? We tend to think of red as being real. This marker is red. It's not actually red. That's the only light frequency that's not being deleted. So that's what we see. But we assume that the red is a characteristic of the object. See how we kind of connect those two? Right? So real world is like NLP. As I did, like everything is perception. Yeah. Like absolutely every, even things we call real are perceived. Yes, we live in an interpreted reality. We live in an interpreted world. All we're surrounded by are ones and zeros, and the only thing that makes any of it make sense are the filters we have in place. But because they're the filters that are always pre-conscious, we assume the things we perceive are exactly the way they are. When in fact, when what we're seeing is <coughs> the compressed or lossy object. Okay, we can't perceive the true reality of this object. All we have is a representation. Okay, because they're representations, though we have tremendous freedom to change them because none of them are really true. So we can interpret and redefine whatever we want to. Okay? Uh, if we want to change somebody's behavior or somebody's experience, we just change the map. But the map is not the experience it represents. As long as you understand that, it's easier to let go of things because the memories we have aren't accurate. They're just what we have. So we can custom design our memories. And really, that's what we should be doing. It's just nobody taught us how. So the criteria, like I told you of all, the criteria that we bring to bear on everything is A, is it appropriate? And how is this making my life better? And if the answer is anything other than it's making my life better, change it. Because the only thing that's holding on to it is you. Right? It's like that old story about, uh, I have all, all these Buddha stories. Once upon a time, Buddha was sitting under a tree, and this man who was addicted to, to poppies came up and goes, Master, Master, please cure me. I'm addicted to poppies. And Buddha reaches up and grabs the tree, trunk, the tree branch. He goes, Help, help, the tree has me. Help, help, I'm a prisoner of the tree. When we don't change, it's because of the things we refuse to do. The things we're not willing to do. The positive worth of the individual is held constant, while the value and appropriateness of internal or external behavior is questioned. In other words, you're not broken. You're not defective. You're not fucked up but you might be doing fucked up shit, right? Remember, identity versus activity. When we start looking at ourselves as being broken, as being damaged, as being something, we're accepting that as an identity which makes it practically impossible to change. But the truth is, it's not who we are. It's just something we're doing. And you can always change what you're doing. Does that make sense?
that's a basis of self-esteem too, right? We all have like a good core and then our, whatever our behaviors are made. We all, and when I talk about the acceptance, rejection, projection, connection, okay? Each and every one of us, the, 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 the repository of, of our value as, a, as an entity is that little spark of consciousness, that little spark of God that resides in each of us, where we're all equal. Not necessarily, well, let me say, we're all equivalent. We're not all equal, but we're all equivalent. Does that make sense? Our value doesn't change. It's based on that seed of consciousness that resides inside of us. Everything else subsequent to that are just projections and reflections and, and, and the value we place on them is arbitrary. It's an arbitrary decision. Okay? And that we can change. Because once we know what the building blocks of that reflection are and how they come to be, we can change it. And I have a whole process. Matter of fact, you were, you were at that training, the Identity by Design training. Or we'll systematically go in and reprogram your identity. We'll, we'll help you custom design who you want to be. We'll but, talk about it at this training, but this, this, the, the, the emphasis on this week's, tra the week's training will be uh, regression and NLP. But it's not about like changing what people said in our memories, right? Like to something completely and utterly different. Like we know that you can say, right? For example, um, I broke up with my first college girlfriend after she actually took the train for 12 hours to see me. Mm -hmm. Regret it like crazy. Mm -hmm. um, but I can't go back and like pretend that didn't happen, right? I can only go back and... Uh, Why not? Because it didn't. Right, but is that useful for you? Um, Are you ever going to see her again? Probably not. So does it really matter? Um, to my own like ethics of knowing that I'm not lying to myself, yeah. Okay, but you know what happened, but how you, you can choose to think differently about it, can't you? Sure, I can give it a different context. Change the perception. Change the perspective, change the frame. I mean, think about it for a minute. She drove 12 hours to the train, right? But what would have happened if she hadn't taken those 12 hours and she'd have gone on believing a lie? What do you mean believing a lie? Well, she, you broke up with her after 12 hours, which means you had decided that you were going to break up with her. What if you had... What if you drugged that out? What if you had... You know, done. What if she had? What if you didn't break up with her? Yeah. You kept pretending that you were still in love with her. You're, you're well, saying examine the alternatives. Is that what you guys? Are well, saying? see, all frames are equally true. You're hung up on she came twelve hours, and then at the end of that, when she arrived, right, that you still broke up with her and for her went all that way. Yeah. But the alternative is yes, that might suck, but it was also better than continuing past that point, which would have been 12 plus whatever more hours. So ultimately, while it was inconvenient, you still made a better choice than prolonging it. Is that what you meant to? That's pretty close, yeah. You're feeling good? You're feeling guilty about feeling good? Feeling good? How's that? About repairing the situation, making it right overall, that it wasn't working out. Repairing? It's interesting. It's definitely an interesting reframe. Okay. But that's the point, is all frames are equally true, you all. That's the secret. In any given interaction, the person who holds the frame the longest and the strongest wins. That may have been the best gift you could have ever given her. You could have set her free. You opened her up to finding somebody who's a better fit, and yourself. And she did. And she did. So, yeah. so, so thank you. Gift. Thank you. She's probably thankful for some aspect. All of them are equally true. Which one makes your life better? But how, keeping that in mind and taking the hypnosis um, like chair for a second, we also want to go back there and forgive ourselves, right? And experience the emotion, like whatever. Emotion sure, we're and they're not right? mutually exclusive. Okay. So I can go back and acknowledge that I broke up with her after 12 hours, experience that. Like That's just part of the experience that you're focusing on. Okay. Well, all the negative emotions that were there that if I repress them, which in that case I think that I dealt with that. Well, again, but you're not, but here's the point, is when you're repressing, you're in denial. 
right. and, and you give more energy to it. When you accept what happens and you ex allow yourself to express the emotions, you gain more information and a better ability to change your perspective. If you deny the emotion, if you deny what happened, then you keep it locked inside of you. And locked in that frame. Mm -hmm. So I can express the, go back there, do whatever regression I need to do, express the emotions, like forgive myself, her, whatever, whoever is it. Yeah. Happens, then go back and say, well, actually, what would have happened if I stayed for 12 hours longer yeah. is it would have been, been even worse. So it's yeah. actually a good thing. Yeah. And that's the reframe. Yeah. It's just, like when you, it's just like when, you know, you've got a boo-boo and the Band-Aid has to come off. So you can do one of two things. You can slowly peel it off or you just go, Shh, get it over with. Yeah. Right? Okay. Thank you. Yep. That's called a metaphor, Thanks. by the way. What's that? Good job, Chris. See, he's, I told you he got the skills. Yeah, no. Yeah, he's basically, <laughs> we're both programmers pretty much, so the way we think is the same. <laughs> that is a reframe. <laughs> that's, that's interesting. That's very interesting. Okay, but cool. Okay, so remember something. You're not fucked up. You're just doing fucked up shit. All right, as, as Richard likes to say it, we're not stupid people, but we do stupid things. Right? He's a little bit more colorful about it than I am, but <laughs> it's the truth. Nobody taught us the, first of all, nobody taught us the difference between thinking and remembering. And that thinking is a deliberate act, remembering is a default act. And thinking takes a lot more energy to mm -hmm. remember. Yeah. Okay. Until thinking about things in certain ways becomes habitual. And then you're just remembering that you can think. Well, no, it just creates a filter that automatically starts to put things in the proper, the proper place. Okay. okay. Anything that we do long enough consciously becomes habit. So it's important that when we install things, we do things that are, we install generaliz generalization processes that work for us most of the time. But we should never just default to uh, rote memory or, or rote, you should always be monitoring. It's like you have a system, but you don't just let the system run, you monitor the system periodically to make sure it's getting you what you want. Right? You don't just set up a website and a funnel and then just let it run for months without checking up on it. Right. You may not do much, but every now and then you check in, just make sure all the numbers are matching up and, and the links are working and things like that. That's just maintenance, right? But it's still a cognitive, conscious, volitional thing that you're doing. Okay. Um, there is a positive intention motivating every behavior and a context in which every behavior has value. Again, no such thing as a bad behavior. Is the behavior or the experience getting you what you want? Is it appropriate to the situation? If the answer is no, change it. Okay? There are times when being furious and pissed off and righteously indignant is perfectly legitimate and there's times when it's not right that's all we're saying so when we start saying I'm in a bad mood how do you know is it is it appropriate to the situation well yeah a guy just cut me off okay is there a better way to deal with it yeah get a machine gun no sorry not. <laughs> but the whole idea is we got to stop thinking about things as being good or bad the moment we remove that distinction, that set of filters from our experience, we get more freedom. We become much more... Our life just gets a lot less stressful and we have, we, we just, life just gets easier. I don't know how to really put it into, into words as specifically as I'd like to, but the minute we stop putting things it's either black or it's white, I don't know, it, just makes, it just makes more, it gives you more freedom, more you ability. Free yourself to, up by avoiding extremities. You can. Remember, it's some, there's a lot of people. For, life is either black or it's white. You know, you're either a good guy or an asshole. Cops like to think that way all the time. Most of your cops who've been in, doing it for any length of time, world's divided into three basic categories. You're either a vil, you're either a perp, which they don't use that word. They hate that word. A civilian or a cop. There's only three, <laughs> right? And they, they have different filters that they use. And the funny thing is that the couples say that another cop never does wrong. Yeah, there's a brotherhood, right? Yeah. 
I'm not saying I'm not passing judgment on it, but again, people don't like to think. It hurts. Literally. It, 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 it burns up energy. It's uncomfortable. They will default to rote memory and, and uh, habit more often than not. But you're saying then thinking of it does become habitual over time. It still uses energy. But again, when it becomes more of a habit, it's not nearly as conscious. Okay? And the more conscious activity a person engages in, the more they burn up their resources. Okay? Um, but the bottom line is, is everything we do, regardless of how stupid or obviously damaging it is to ourselves, has at its seed a positive intention. When you get up on stage to do public speaking and you go, ah! right? That <laughs> moment actually is trying to do something positive for you. There's a positive reason why you're doing it. Usually it's to get you out of the situation, to protect you, right? Once you understand that every behavior we generate, even if it's obviously detrimental to our long-term growth and happiness, has a positive intention, you gain the ability to change the behavior. Okay? Your unconscious mind loves you unconditionally. Okay? It does. But it doesn't think in terms of your long-term growth and happiness. It thinks about what's happening right now and how do I fix it? How do I get out of it? How do I survive it? Your unconscious mind is every bit as smart as the rest of you, probably smarter. But it's deeply emotional and it has about the rational cognitive capacity of a 10-year-old. Would you let a 10-year-old run your life? Right? Would you give a 10 year old the keys to your car? Right? No. So we need to educate it. We need to guide it. We need to inform it about what's appropriate, what's not, based on its language, on how it sees the world. Okay? When you, when theoretically, once you've vented the emotion and you've created an even playing field, hey, Jacob, when you, when you give the unconscious mind a better way of doing something, after you've explained to it how what it's doing is hurting you, the unconscious mind is much more likely to change because its job is two, basically, to keep you happy and healthy and to keep you safe. And if it has to choose between the two, it will choose safety over happiness. Okay? Because that's the prime directive of the unconscious mind, to protect you, to keep you alive and move your genes forward. So okay. you mentioned giving the keys to a 10-year-old to your car, but a lot of the driving that we do is unconscious. Yeah, it's habit. And so is that, are you implying that's problematic? What I'm saying is just letting your unconscious mind go wherever it wants, highly problematic. Okay? Letting your response, let's put it this way, you're driving, somebody cuts you off, what's your emotional response? Okay, crash into them or something, yeah. Road rage, right? Yeah. That's letting the 10-year-old drive the car. Like the safety of the driving, even though I'm listening to music. Well, we're talking about decision-making, not necessarily behaviors. Oh, well, we're talking about activities. I'm talking about how it makes decisions, how it decides to do things. Okay? Would you let a 10-year-old tell you how to run your life? Okay, so the tell you is the, the powerful part there. Yeah. Well, it's, well it's, gonna, it's not just going to tell you, it's going to do it. So I'm telling my subconscious mind, you gotta, you're a safe driver. You've got to pay attention. Is that like well, that's an identity statement. I'm just, can you just clarify the driving thing real quick? About Maybe we should driving. use a better metaphor. Anybody got a better metaphor for you all? What, are you to uh, what happens when you default to letting the unconscious mind do everything? Without mod without so it's do everything. That's it. That's it's basically that's what you're talking about. Yeah. It's not would, do something. Would you? Yeah. A, a good example is you have a goal. Mm -hmm. And if you keep doing the same things you've always done, you're mm -hmm. never going to get to it. Right. So you have to intervene with that subconscious. You have to teach the 10-year-old how to do something, yeah. right? And, and do something. Otherwise, if you let them try to figure it out on their own, learning curve is going to be a lot start sharper, isn't it? Okay, now I, I see what you're saying. Okay, so there has to be a balance between the conscious and the unconscious. But it ha they have to be balanced. 
problem we have a lot of times is the conscious mind tries to do shit it's not trained to do. Like physical shit. That's what happens when people choke, is the conscious mind and the unconscious mind start to argue. In my martial arts that I teach, I, I, I show you how to screw people up with that. I make people punch at me and I'll go like this and I'll go... And you just see the, 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 the eyes glaze over. Because I basically create a momentary parts conflict between the conscious mind and the unconscious mind. And when the parts are in conflict, all forward motion stops. Okay? So, but just the bottom line is, remember that every behavior you engage in, regardless of how obviously detrimental it is, even cutting behavior, people are self-mutilating, there's a positive intention behind it. There's a reason they're doing it. you got to find it. you got to find it and find a way for them to keep the result or the, the, out, the desired outcome of the behavior while changing the behavior. Okay? Feedback versus failure. You know, they say feedback is the breakfast of champions. Kind of like that myself. Okay? You don't fail in, in, in the world according to David. This is not pure textbook NLP, but this is how I look at the world. You never fail until you quit. Everything else is just a break. It's just a rest. Okay? As long as you pick yourself up and keep on going, everything else is just feedback. You found another way that the light bulb won't, won't work. Look at Edison. Most of us give up way too soon. You know, or we insist that the dynamics of the world be different than what they are. Those things are ultimately self-correcting because the laws of the universe, laws of physics, don't usually change. So we either come to recognize the laws of social dynamics and, and the universe, or we keep getting the same result, which is technically the definition of insanity. Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. Right. But feedback versus failure is important, because all, all results and behaviors are simply achievements. They're all something we've accomplished, whether they're desired outcomes for a given task, context, or not. Actually, the earliest example of this predates um, NLP. Anybody remember Dr. Seuss? Remember the, uh, the cat in the hat? The fastest way to find something is to find where it isn't. Right? I, would, I don't know that that's exactly true, but it's the same concept. There is no failure, only feedback. Right? By the way, you wrote that on the board, and I, unless I missed it, you never addressed it. Oh, really? Maybe he just did it while we were sitting there. Is that the stuff that you were talking about with... No, with like the forgetting? <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> I, I, you know, I can never tell with David if he's fucking with me or if he's actually serious. Because he always has talking about his face. about forgetting? I, I don't recall that. <laughs> <laughs> Fractionation. Fractionation is your friend in everything. The principle of fractionation from a hypnotic perspective if I put you in trance and then I bring you somewhat out of it, and then I put you back in. When you go back into trance, you will go deeper into it than you were before. And that will continue to happen. The more I fractionate you, the deeper you go. In the first induction that we teach called the Four Magic Bullets, there's a point where I take your, my hand and put it over your eyes and go, open your eyes, close your eyes, open your eyes, close your eyes, open your eyes, close your eyes. Every time you open your eyes, you come up a little bit out of trance. Every time you close them, you go deeper. You did that yesterday. Yes, I did. Almost like I planned it. Almost. Okay. He had his first session with me yesterday. so He, he came out of trance and went pretty much, what the fuck just happened? That was pretty much, that was exactly what happened. <laughs> <laughs> okay. They don't have to believe. They just have to obey. And this is an important, this is an important thing for you as a hypnotist. Okay, because most traditional schools will teach you that if the person doesn't believe they can be hypnotized or is even against being hypnotized, or they won't be. That's not true. All you got to do is get them to follow instructions. Hypnosis in this school, how I teach it, is a physiological process. It's a physiological condition. Okay? However, no matter how deep into hypnosis you go, 
you never lose your ability to accept or reject a suggestion. That's a volitional thing. Okay? But if I tell you to do four simple things, your body and your brain will in fact go into a hypnagogic state. It can't not happen as long as you follow the instructions. Right? So you will always be successful in hypnotizing people. No matter how deep they go, it's their choice to accept or reject a suggestion. Which means the burden of change and the result of the, of the session is up to them. If they accept the suggestions, they follow the instructions, they'll get the result. If they don't, they won't. But the question of whether they can be hypnotized, not an issue. Okay? It's physiological. Uh, questions on any of this? Of course. Yeah. Um, how do you deal with people with OCD? Same way I deal with people who don't have it. I tell them what to do and, and beat their ass until they do. So uh, the, the reason that I ask is that a lot of times, it, it, like oh, obsessive compulsive disorder, um, <laughs> like <laughs> rituals are strategies for achieving a particular yeah, like feeling or whatever. Yeah. Right? So do you replace if the strategy is not good? Like say people that wash their hands like a hundred times a day, mm -hmm. okay, probably bad, right? Uh, a, it takes a lot of time. It's bad for their skin. Whatever. Like, are do they define it as bad? If they define it as bad, hey, everything they define they, as interfering with their lives. Well, here's, again, here's my point. If they don't define it as a problem, it's not a problem. So it's a problem for them, and they wish they didn't have to do it, but they feel obligated to do it because that's the only way they feel safe. Okay. So, so it's about safety. Right. Okay. So the problem, the behavior is only a symptom. But what would you replace that to get a feeling of safety? How else could what they What caused the feeling safety? in the first place? What caused the issue for safety in the first place? You don't deal with symptoms, you deal with causes. This is where I kind of have a fundamental difference of opinion with, with Richard uh, using NLP. Um, I find many times that you've got to do the hypnosis to get to the cause. Richard says, no, just change the, change the code and you'll change everything. I don't find that to be true. Matter of fact, when I see Richard doing a lot of change work, he'll slam them into trance first. And then he'll do the change work. Okay, A lot of how you bring your NLP skills to bear depends on the client. Okay, There are some people who have just, um, they have so many defense mechanisms up, you've got to slam them into trance. Because they'll keep cognitively re-undoing what you're trying to get them to do. It's, it's a weird thing, but uh, it's just easier to put them into trance and get the work done. But conversationally, if you have the skills, which you'll have, um, you'll be able to do a lot of things without an, an obvious induction. But what if they can't remember for an induction? You've got to remember some sort of event. What if they have no memory of why they feel unsafe? Are people Unconscious are always knows. There's only, here's the thing. There's only two entities in the universe that know everything there is to know about you. God and your unconscious mind. Sometimes God doesn't take my calls, but your unconscious mind is always home. <laughs> okay? Although I'm, I'm pretty tight with the big G, so. But that's just the way it works. Your unconscious mind always knows. Always. So you don't see people not being able to express like a memory of why they feel the way they feel? That doesn't mean it isn't there. But you're asking, like yesterday in regression, like you, you asked me to remember something, and I happen to remember a particular event. Well, what do you do with people who can't express that with words? Like they don't remember a particular event. Then you focus on what they can remember or what they feel. Many times when you're, when you're dealing with traumas, you'll have people who say, well, I don't remember anything. It's just black. Okay, focus on the blackness. In a moment, not yet, but in just a moment, I'm going to count from one to five. As I count from one to five, the blackness is going to be increasing. It's going to grow stronger and stronger and stronger. By the time I reach number five, you'll fly back to the very first scene, situation, or event that has everything to do with this blackness. There you go. And they actually start describing stuff? Hell yeah. They, they see stuff that they just couldn't access before. Okay. No. Because the blackness is there for a reason. Right? Which means if it's there for a reason, it's connected to something. And if you keep amplifying that, you'll activate the pathway to the initial sensitizing event, the reason it's there. 
Okay. I've had it happen several times. What if they don't remember that there is a particular event where they see blackness? They just don't have a recollection of why they need to feel safe. Then I focus on where they have the feeling in the body. So and I amplify the feeling and I follow it back. Yeah. I'll get there. Okay. And again, if they're not, sometimes people aren't ready to deal. There are times when they're just not ready. You know, so you have to kind of use that. But mostly, most of the time, that just won't be that. Well, that won't be the case. Most of the time, people come to you for something inane, something relatively minor, and the next thing you know, you're dealing with the life-altering trauma somewhere. That's that's mostly the way it works. At least for my life, I don't get weight loss clients. I get the weird stuff, <laughs> right? But it's the same. It's a, you know when you deal with that stuff on a pretty regular basis, getting people to lose weight, it's pretty straightforward. Yeah. So, it is twelve thirty, lunchtime. Uh, how long you guys want? Hour, hour and a half. It's good for you. Hour is fine. An hour is good. All right. We'll see you at one thirty. Be there or be square. <laughs>